This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream. If you had asked most China watchers whether the CCP would scrap zero COVID even a couple of weeks ago, they'd have probably told you no way. However, after the unprecedented protests a couple of weeks ago, that seems to be what's happened. Last week, China's National Health Commission announced that basically every anti-COVID measure was being relaxed, and the virus is now sweeping through the country. So in this video, we're going to have a look at the CCP's recent policy shift, what motivated it, and why it might be a riskier move than the CCP anticipate. So let's get into it. On Wednesday last week, China's National Health Commission announced a massive relaxation of China's COVID measures. Previously, there were basically three mechanisms by which the CCP enforced zero COVID. Mass testing, quarantine, and lockdowns. Negative tests were required for basically anything, including using public transport. Positive cases were often quarantined in massive state-run quarantine centres, and whole cities were locked down based on a single case. The new regulations scale back all three of these. Almost immediately, local authorities started relaxing restrictions. Local authorities in Guangzhou, for example, partially lifted a weeks-long lockdown in the city of 15 million people, despite the fact that case numbers were rising. In Beijing, case numbers are currently spiking, but there's no sign of a lockdown. Just as quickly, Chinese state media started downplaying the dangers of COVID, with state television running pieces claiming that more than 90% of cases of the year-old Omicron variant are mild or asymptomatic. On December the 8th, a day after the announcement, the Global Times ran a piece quoting a doctor at Sun Yat-sen University who questioned the existence of long COVID. This is an astonishingly sharp U-turn by the CCP's propaganda machine. Just a month ago, state television was running pieces almost daily, talking up the dangers of COVID and long COVID and criticising foreign countries, especially the US, for their reckless attitude to the virus. So why is this? Why have the CCP finally ditched zero COVID? Well, the proximate cause of the U-turn is probably the protests. In late November, anti-lockdown protests erupted across China, with thousands of Chinese in most of China's main cities demanding an end to zero COVID, and in some cases, an end to Xi Jinping. There had been anti-lockdown protests in the past, but until last month, they'd always been concentrated in a single city or province, and usually directed at a specific rule or restriction. These were the first coordinated nationwide protests since the Tiananmen Square protest in 1989, representing the most significant challenge to the CCP's authority in the past 30 years. Clearly, the zero COVID U-turn is in some sense a response to the protesters' demands and an effort by the CCP to calm the unrest. However, the protests might have been the proximate cause for the CCP scrapping of zero COVID. It's worth saying that zero COVID was beginning to take an unpalatable economic toll. Thanks to Omicron's increased infectivity, maintaining zero COVID was requiring harsher and wider lockdowns. Obviously, lockdowns reduce economic activity, which is one reason why analysts have constantly been revising down China's GDP estimates over the past few months. China's economic data for November, released on Wednesday, was even more miserable than analysts expected. On top of the lost economic activity, coordinating China's enormous quarantine program was eye-wateringly expensive. China's bill for COVID tests alone is estimated to have come to about 1.7 trillion yen this year, which, for context, is about 1.5% of GDP, or nearly all of China's public spending on education. Anyway, all of this economic damage threatened to undermine the implicit contract between the CCP and the Chinese public. That, in exchange for going without democratic freedoms, the people enjoy steady economic growth and improving standards of living. You get the idea. While the protests might have been the proximate cause for this U-turn, it does look like zero COVID was becoming economically unsustainable anyway. However, while zero COVID clearly had its downsides, scrapping the policy comes with its own risks. While we should expect China's economic fortunes to improve, the screeching U-turn could undermine the CCP's political legitimacy. In scrapping zero COVID, the CCP are tacitly admitting that their flagship policy, which they were adamantly defending only weeks ago, was a mistake. This obviously wasn't a great look, and while the CCP's propaganda machine is working around the clock to convince the Chinese public otherwise, it's hard to imagine your average Chinese citizen, who spent the last three years hearing about how dangerous COVID is, concluding from this shift in policy that the CCP is as infallible as ever. 
This is especially likely if the relaxation is accompanied by a spike in COVID-related deaths, which is very possible. The Chinese population is particularly vulnerable to COVID for at least three reasons. First, China hasn't vaccinated a sufficient fraction of its elderly, who are generally pretty wary of non-traditional medicines. About 90% of China's total population is fully vaccinated, but the percentages are far lower amongst the over 80s, of whom only 40% have received a booster jab. Second, China has refused to import Western mRNA vaccines, and their homemade Sinopharm and Zinofax vaccines aren't as effective. While the data is a little mixed, last year a study from Hong Kong found that two doses of Sinovac were only 58% effective against severe COVID or death in the over 80s, compared to 87% for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Third, China doesn't have the health infrastructure to cope with a large spike in cases. China has one of the lowest critical care bed rates in Asia, and there is little public health infrastructure in rural areas. That's why a study from Shanghai's Fudan University in May warned of a tsunami of COVID cases and roughly 1.6 million deaths if China abandoned its zero COVID policy. Similarly, modelling by The Economist suggests that if the virus was left unchecked, new infections would peak at 45 million people a day after a month. To mitigate against this, the CCP are investing in more public health infrastructure, including more antivirals and a new vaccine campaign for the elderly. But this is unlikely to be sufficient. There's already some evidence that hospitals are feeling the strain. While official case numbers are actually down, that's mainly because less testing is happening, and the number of emergency calls to hospitals has already increased sixfold since last week. Anyway, you get the idea. While it might placate the protesters, this new policy risks a serious health emergency, and to some extent, the CCP's political legitimacy. Now, while that sounds like bad news for Xi Jinping, I do have some good news for the rest of you, because Nebula is having a big sale at the moment. You've heard me tell you about Nebula before, but there's a big sale on right now, so if you've ever considered signing up, now's the time. Essentially though, Nebula is the streaming service we built with a bunch of your other favourite creators. Over there, we've posted a bunch of exclusive full-length TLDR videos which will never come to YouTube, but you'll also find a load of our normal videos early and ad-free free there too. As I said, it's not just us either, there's tons of other amazing creators too, which makes it astonishing you can get all of this exclusive and ad-free content for less than one dollar a month. Normally, people sell you things as being less than a cup of coffee. This is less than a bottle of water and a fraction of what other streaming services are charging. Services which don't directly support independent creators. This crazy good offer is only available right now, and it's only possible through our Nebula Curiosity Stream bundle. Essentially, if you sign up to Curiosity Stream for the crazy low price of $11.59 a year, then you get free access to Nebula as long as you're a member. That's right, two platforms for less than a dollar a month. And Curiosity Stream is awesome. It contains absolutely boatloads of high quality documentaries on all kinds of topics I know TLDR viewers will love. So if you want both for less than a dollar a month, then the link's down below. And if you've ever considered signing up to support TLDR, now's the cheapest time to do so. So thank you.